Welcome to the Top Business Leaders Show, powered by Rise 25 Media. We feature top founders, executives, and business leaders from all over the world. Chad Franzen here, co-host for this show, where we feature top restaurateurs, investors, and business leaders. This is part of our Spot On series. Spot On has the best-in-class payment platform for retail, and they have a flagship solution called Spot On Restaurant, where they combine marketing, software, and payments all in one. They've served everyone from larger chains like Dairy Queen and Subway to small mom-and-pop restaurants. To learn more, go to spoton.com. This episode is brought to you by Rise25. We help B2B businesses to get ROI, clients, referrals, and strategic partners through Done For You Podcasts. If you have a B2B business and want to build great relationships with clients, referral partners, and thought leaders in your space, there's no better way to do it than through podcasts and content marketing. To learn more, go to rise25media.com or email us at support at rise25media.com. For the past 16 and a half years, Mike Pruitt has been chairman and CEO of Emergent Hospitality Group, whose portfolio includes Little Big Burger, Burgers Grilled Right, American Burger Company, Pizza Rev, and Hooters. He has, he has a demonstrated history as a chairman in multiple industries and played on two NAIA World Series baseball teams while earning his business degree at Coastal Carolina. Mike, thank you so much for joining me today. How are you? I'm doing great. I appreciate you and thank you for having me. My pleasure. So what position did you play at Coastal Carolina? So I was, uh, I was recruited there to play third base. I had a kind of an interesting, you know, I'd say storybook baseball. You know, mm -hmm. I grew up in Maryland and Cal Ripken and I were actually played on the same summer league team. We were arch rivals in high school. Cal played shortstop and pitch and I played third base. And so yeah, I was, you know, did really well in high school and was recruited to Coastal previous two years, two years prior to me getting there. They had went to the World Series, didn't make it for the next couple of years. And they recruited me there to replace the third baseman that he decided he, he thought he was going to get drafted and not come back. And so I went down there as a third baseman. And unfortunately, he didn't get drafted high enough. He came back. And so the, the, coaches convinced me that as you know I was a really good hitter can really run fast that if I could play second base you know I'd have a chance to get drafted pretty high so I ended up playing second base my first year in the World Series and then uh, and then my senior year we got beat by the eventual national champion in the next to last round my junior year my senior year the coach said for the good of the team but I moved to first base which gives you an indication that I wasn't a great second baseman so uh but I was still a really good hitter. And unfortunately, we went to the World Series again and lost to the eventual national champions Zooms at the next to last round that year as well. So, uh, but I am actually leaving. I sit on the board of trustees for Coastal uh, for baseball, their foundation board, their endowment. And uh, I'm actually leaving to go there tomorrow because it's our homecoming weekend. And I've played in our homecoming charity golf event for 17 years with my three roommates that I played ball with. Oh, so wow. Well, very I met, nice. Met, met great friends. <laughs> and, and in fact, it kind of leads to the most interesting story of how I got in the restaurant business because uh, through Coastal, I made a donation back in 2000 to fund a scholarship for a kid that played on the team with me who passed away. And they asked me to join the board. Well, on the board was the founder of Hooters. Uh, you know, the founder of Hooters grew up on a farm about nine miles from coastal where he never had indoor plumbing. Uh, he went to, he went, he was a, grew up on a tobacco farm, went to Clemson on an agricultural scholarship, started naturally fresh salad dressing. And, and then this concept called Hooters started in Clearwater, Florida, and he was selling a ranch and blue cheese salad dressing. And so I went down and said, man, you're buying a lot of ranch and blue tea salad dressing. Have you thought about growing this? And they said, well, we don't have any money to grow beyond this. So he licensed the concept and created a business called Hooters of America. And he grew that concept um, and was incredibly successful, as was naturally for our salad dressing. And um, he gave Coastal in 2002 the money to start a football program. And so they asked him to sit on the board with me. and. He and I met, he became a friend, kind of a mentor, and I was running an investment fund with about 40 families, and he came to me in 2006 and said, hey, 
I've never had a partner in my life. You know, I like, trust, and admire you. Would you and your families consider making an investment in Hooters? Because I want to take it public, and I don't know how to do it. And then you can represent you and me as an owner and put the deal together to try to take it public. So we made an investment in the Hooters brand in, in 2006. And we spent the next four months with my two analysts and his CFO putting together initial stuff to have intelligent conversations with investment banks over what their thought would be in terms of going public. And uh, in one week, three investment banks after those first meetings, he unfortunately dropped dead of a brain aneurysm. And okay. so, so in the documents from that investment, he put in there, something ever happened to him. If the family wanted to sell it, he gave me the right of first refusal to buy the company, not his own son, who was president of Hooters at the time. And uh, so needless to say, the son wasn't happy um, and actually tried to sue me to break the right of first refusal. But his his uh, his best friends who were executors of his will you know, said that's what your dad wanted. And they made sure that that in fact, that right of first refusal stayed in place. And so I ended up partnering with a private equity firm and took four years to go through the estate courts. But we ended up buying Hooters in 2012. And it turned out to be an amazing investment. And I met two of the best private equity partners possible in the restaurant space. Uh, we brought in the former president of Coca-Cola North America to run it. He doubled the profits of the business over the next six or seven years. And in 2019, we sold the controlling state in the brand to another private equity firm. And we still maintain, you know, a small equity state, myself, our clients and emergent hospitality group in the Hooters brand. But from that experience, you know, we made the decision in 2015 to broaden you know, into other concepts, non-Hooters related. And we picked the better burger category where we bought American Burger and then Burgers Grilled Right in DC, as you mentioned. And then, you know, what's now our most, you know, our largest and most profitable brand, Little Big Burger that was started up in Portland, Oregon. And then recently, Pizza Wrap, as you mentioned. So what, uh, I'm sure you mentioned it. What were you doing when this Hooters opportunity came up? So I it was brought into two situations. You know, out of college, I was a manufacturer's rep for 3M, which is a glorified commission sales job. And you know, I used to get up every morning going back to baseball and brush my teeth and say to myself, if I could be successful one out of three times today, I'm going to the Hall of Fame. And so I built the territory, then I built the sales force underneath of me and got very fortunate that Charlotte, North Carolina, where I live and I'm based. You know, who would have thought back in the late 90s that, you know, First Union, NCMB, we're going to start buying every bank, you know, regional bank, national banks in the country and moving their corporate data centers to Charlotte and 3M, the company that I represented, their data storage division. They created a storage product, you know, for data that was its number one in the industry. And I became the number one 3M rep in the United States in 1989. And so they flew me to Palm Springs, California to celebrate. And while I was there, a guy offered to buy it on a cocktail napkin and I sold the business. I became a subsidiary of his company and you know he could afford to pay me more than I could pay myself because he took all my overhead away from me. And that guy, Mike Carroll's his name, is still a mentor, a friend, and was on my board for a number of years. I have tremendous respect for him. And, uh, and so, so I kind of got in this niche of, you know, building sales and sales forces around unique technology. And so I did two different projects for two different investor groups, the last of which we sold to a public company. And that was my first experience with public stock. I'll be honest with you. I was, you know, 40 years old, give or take. I didn't have a brokerage account at 40. So I remember coming home with, to my wife and we had three kids and saying, honey, I got this stock certificate and it's worth $750,000. And her reply was, well, last time I checked the grocery store would take, doesn't take stock certificates. Mm -hmm. 
you know, you can't sell it for a year. That was the, you know, that was a condition of the sale. She goes, what are we going to do between now and a year from now? So I ended up, uh, two of those investors in that business said, Hey, we really like what you did for us. You know, why don't you look for other investments, you know, on our behalf that one was a very wealthy guy. And so I created this business called Avenel Financial Group to look for investment opportunities that those two guys and others can invest in and where I could add value in myself. And then as luck would have it, and I do say it was a good piece of luck, uh, by the time we could sell the stock a year later, the stock had went up seven times the original amount. Wow. So yeah, so the guys that it put in like five to seven million dollars in the deal. We're up fifty to seventy million dollars. So, you know, it was you know pretty easy to get them to want to invest. So I ended up. I'm a diehard Warren Buffett fan, so I ended up doing a partnership model that was Buffett's original partnership model, where I charged no management fees. First six percent yearly went to the investor, and it was a hurdle rate. And then you know, I got six, you know twenty five percent above that hurdle rate, and so. And I typically did convert preferred deals where we could cover the hurdle rate. So when there was an X, that truly did get 25% of it. And I put my own money in alongside of them. And Hooters is a perfect example of that. At 17 investors, we put $5 million into Hooters in the form of a convertible note. And, uh, and that was kind of what I did for 10 or 11 years. And you know, the rest is kind of history. Sure. You said you were... So you were in your 40s by the time you uh, acquired Hooters. Up until that time, did you ever envision yourself kind of having restaurants as big a part of your life as they are now? Absolutely not. You know, I always joke, I'm 61 now. So I always joke that if somebody would have told me at any age, forget about the fact 40, 50, or 60, that I'd get up most days with some reason to think about the Hooters restaurant chain, I would have told them, you know, they were absolutely nuts. But and it really was never our intention. You know, our intention was to go public, get stock, sell it, make a return, not be a part of, you know, what's become a, what, nine-year journey, you know, of it. You know, but when he died, you know, him giving me that right of first refusal, I felt responsible for the legacy that he had created. I mean, when you think about South Carolina, and, you know, he's got to go down as one of the top entrepreneurs of all time. I mean, given the fact where he came from, um, the fact that we gave their family over $200 million for the Hooters brand, naturally fresh, you know, got a ton of money as well. He had real estate holdings. He had, I mean, but you would have never known he had two nickels rubbed together. He drove a 12-year-old car, wore tacky kind of clothes. You know, he was a great guy. And I remember asking his two best friends when he died, who I used to have lunch with all the time, you know, why was he so good to me? And he said, because you never asked him for something. I mean, his whole life, people were always asking him for something. And instead, you actually gave him money and helped him. So it, it was a relationship that I cherished. I really enjoyed it. And, you know, it was shocking when he passed away the way he did. And uh, I still have maintained a friendship with his widow and his daughter, uh, who is now in college. But, um, you know, so I, I feel, you know, a kinship. And the original founders of Hooters and Clearwater, uh, the president of that group, has become one of my best friends. So, uh, so it's, it's, you know, it's still something that, you know, I think about the brand, you know, each day, probably at some point in the day. If we were doing this at our conference room, you'd see a, n- a number of pieces of memorabilia associated with, you know, our Hooters in business. When did you decide? So during your kind of uh, tenure as owner of Hooters, when did you decide? Okay, this industry is something that I think is, you know, a worthwhile investment. And you and what made you decide to start to acquire other types of um, restaurants? Um. You know, I'll be honest with you fairly quickly on the Hooters side, because, you know, they, you know, they were, his philosophy was one third corporate stores, two third franchise. So, you know, he, he had a very simplistic view of business. And that is for every two franchise I sold, I take the profits from them, open a corporate store debt-free. 
he didn't even have a line of credit at the bank, you know, when we bought. He was ultra conservative in how he managed it. And so when we looked at the business to value it in order to make our investment, I was like, this doesn't take a lot of rocket science to look and say, you got 30 some million dollars coming in and this thing called royalty revenue. And you got about two or three million dollars of overhead that you're spending to operate that part of the business. It's pretty hard to mess that up. And so I said, you know, so if everything hit the fan, you knew that part of the business was going to be pretty stable. And we could historically look at the last 15 years and see how stable it was. You know, it's a lot harder to operate those restaurants, you know, so therefore he had whatever hundred and some corporate stores, they struggled to make the same dollar amount as the franchise arm, yet they were, you know, whatever, four, five times, you know, the size revenue. And he had all these people and all the people to manage. So, you know, I, I became fairly fat. I'm an entrepreneur at heart. So I came really fascinated by the franchising piece of the restaurant industry. And when you look at the industry and you see how many people, you know, whether it's a Subway franchise or whatever, you know, Jersey Mike's in my area, I go to all the time and I, I got to know the guy that owns them. I mean, those, those owners pour their heart and soul and everything into making it work. And I'll be honest with you, I always found interesting is so many times over the last 20 years, you find guys that made a bunch of money, did really well in the restaurant business. They sold out. As soon as their non-compete was up, they got right back in it because they knew the playbook. They knew the formula. And the guys that you know knew the formula, they, could, they were really good at it. And they knew how to make money at it. And that's to me, has always been fascinating to watch. Sure. So you, so you must have somehow learned the formula or had people around you that knew the formula because you hadn't had a, a background in the restaurant, restaurant industry. What was that? Was there a learning curve for you, even though you had been very successful uh, prior to you know, getting into Hooters? Well, I think it's a couple of things. Going back to being a Buffett guy, you know, everything we invested in, we tried to have a moat, right? That would protect the downside. So, you know, we did our best up front to analyze all the risk to have a moat. And part of that was it could be the concept, it could be the marketplace, but most likely it was the people, you know, in the restaurant industry. So yeah, I I have no claim to be a great restaurant operator. Even today, 20 years later, I do think I'm pretty good now at identifying good restaurant operators and good concepts. But myself, I don't know that I'd be the guy to develop the concept. I, don't, I certainly wouldn't be the guy to operate it. But I have great empathy and excitement and for the team that we have and the team we've made a number of acquisitions and the teams that we've been, you know, picked up through acquisition. And when they're good at it, they love it. And you know, our president, Fred Flick, I think he skips to work. I mean, he loves running our restaurant businesses and he loves running, the, you know, dealing with the people it takes to run those businesses and the customers and creating the loyalty programs. And so, you know, and I, the same thing was with Terry Marks, who was the president of Hooters under our reign. You know, he built a team that was unbelievable and it was a true joy to watch them work and see the joy in their accomplishments. As I said, they doubled profits over a seven year period. You know, that's pretty darn good. And uh, so, you know, now look, I've also learned from mistakes because, you know, I've often said when I look back at my life, you know, I've made money, you know, I certainly have overachieved and out, out kicked, you know, my coverage in terms of what, you know, my wife thought probably when she married me and my professors thought, you know, when I was at Coastal, some of which have confirmed that to me. <laughs> but, you know, I say I've made more money in my life. I've lost more money than I ever thought I'd make in my life too. So I've made plenty of mistakes. But when I look back at those mistakes, you know, which I don't try to dwell on, um, but when I look at the successes, it was usually where, you know, I invested with or in great people 
you know, Hooters being one of them, you know, and, you know, finding a truly a management team or a leadership team where their interests are purely aligned with the investors. And, and I've always said, I'm not looking to make money off people. I'm looking to make money with people. So sharing that incentivizing them and, you know, being in a position where, you know, we all make do well when everybody does well, you know, and typically where I've messed up is, you know, there's been times where, you know, things were going so well that maybe I took, I definitely took risk that I didn't really think through. And, and a lot of times when that occurs, those risks come to fruition and you lose money. Uh, and then there's luck, right? I always tell people, you know, you don't ever want to think it's blind luck, but you know, there's a lot of luck in being in the game when the game's going the right way. And, you know, if you can grind it out and hang in there, there's going to be times where, you know, the, it, you know, when the ball is, you know, going the right way, the game's going the right way, you can, uh, truly benefit by being in the game. What's an example, uh, if, if you don't mind talking about it, what's an example of maybe a risk that you took that didn't work out well for you, but maybe you learned learned something from? Well, I, there's a couple of different things. I think, you know, I look back, the two biggest losses I took personally and from an investing, you know, one, I'm not sure I can truly blame the guy because I invested in a technology platform around the home building industry and the first three years just did amazing. And then 2008, 2009 came and the world crashed, right? From a financial service, the mortgage backed securities, everything crashed. And so home builders froze, they stopped building, they stopped growing, you know, they're, they, so, you know, that business went from a good business to a bad business overnight. And there's certainly no blame I could put on, the management team, they tried to hold it in there. They probably, if only thing, they probably had leverage when they wish they didn't have leverage, which also hurt them. Their banks called their credit facilities because of way every bank was calling their, everybody's credit facility. And so I took a pretty big hit, including one of which was my best friend um, growing up who became a franchise partner and was growing my old hometown area where I grew up in Maryland. And it, it, it bankrupted him. And so, you know, so I lost doubly. I lost on the parent company and I lost banking on him. You know, the other is I followed the guy who made, you know, and I've learned this unfortunate lesson twice. Uh, Sometimes it's really good to partner with hugely successful people. Other times it's not because if they, if it turns out to be a bad deal, it's a, it's a rounding error for them. Whereas for you, it could be a really devastating error. And so there's been a couple of cases where I've invested in a very wealthy with alongside of a very wealthy guy in a particular industry. And he just wrote it off. And unfortunately it didn't hurt him, but it really hurt me. And, uh, but that's, you know, the, the first guy is the guy who gave me the opportunity where he made $70 million and that public company, when it went, you know, we got the seller stock. And like I say, I, I did really well too. So I almost felt obligated when he asked me to invest alongside him in something, but you know, I lost a million dollars. You know, he oh. lost, a mil- he lost more than a million dollars, but it didn't, you know, he, it was like, didn't bother him. You know, it was a mistake and you know, it really hurt me. So but overall, I really do. I think one of my, you know, if I have strengths, you know, there's one of those strengths is I don't dwell on, you know, failures. You live and learn, move on. And I always tell people the net, net, net still better than I ever thought that I would be in this position at this age. So, you know, I got three great kids, you know, been married 36 years, 35 years. I'm on my 36th and, uh, and yeah, you know, I got no complaints. Sure. That's, that's great. Uh, so obviously, um, burger restaurants have been a pretty good investment for you so far. What would you say are the keys to success of, of your burger restaurants? Well, I'd say, first of all, we bought successful concepts. So, you know, I'd say our best, our best concept was little big burger. Um, and that was started by a chef 
and and at the time his wife who was a marketing kind of guru branding guru and then they decided not to be husband and wife anymore. so they sold it to split the asset we bought it and you know we did you know, i told our people and you know this is a buffett thing too look just don't mess it up it's working really really well and so and then over time you know we've opened a bunch more of those units and everyone we've opened basically in oregon has continued because of the branding and how well it's thought of has continued to just really grow and then from here between here and there we've tweaked a couple of things where you know we tested a ground chicken burger it worked so well so you know we we certainly positioned it as a test because if it didn't work well we were more than happy to pull it off but it works so well so we just little things along the way um you know, it's just taking something that was working and we didn't mess it up. And then we have just been really fortunate. And I give credit where credit's due to Fred. You know, he got out of head in mid 2019 with a loyalty program. People have apps on their phone for Little Big Burger. You know, we have over a couple hundred thousand people on there now. And so when COVID came, you know, we were in a good position to deal with takeout and delivery from the outset. And so we captured you know, you know, a lot of business through that. And it's a great product. I mean, my wife is a, is a runner and for 30 years, she's been disciplined enough. When I order fries, she takes a couple and little big burgers, truffle fries. She now says half's mine, half short, <laughs> you know? So, so we serve a great product and, you know, we got great people running it underneath Fred, um, you know, from our brand leader. And then in DC, you know, BGR has, you know, They've won Best Burger in D.C., you know, multiple times. And, you know, it's a high quality product. Robert King, who runs it, who when we bought it, he was he started out as a store manager. And when we bought it, he was a you know a regional manager. And now, you know, we call him brand leader because he's over the entire brand. You know, he's done a very similar job in that market and loves it. And has been with the company more than 10 years. And, you know, he just gets up every day, loves what he does. And, you know, he's created it. And now, like I said, we're trying to duplicate that in the pizza business with uh, the acquisition of Pizza Rev. And so, you know, we're excited about that. And what, is, what attracted you to Pizza Rev? Well, it was a very unique deal, you know, in that um, it was a hot brand, you know, back, you know, three years ago. It unfortunately got hurt, you know, with COVID. You know, some of the franchisees were unable to continue operating. And so the PE firm that was VC PE firm that was behind it, um, they had gotten some money from the government to salvage it, you know, and they made a decision that there was probably someone like us better suited to turn the business around. And so, you know, we, we were able to come to a fairly quick deal where, you know, we took it over. Uh, they have some incentives from us as it relates to future if it does better under our regime than theirs with uh, they have you know some, have a note that we owe them and they can convert it into stock in the future if they want. But we picked up a great guy and Matt Avila who run you know is kind of that brand leader. And you know we all really come to appreciate Matt, like him and we look forward to building you know other pizza concepts around. Matt and his brand leadership and underneath, you know, Fred as well. So, so look, we're early into the, you know, we're in the first innings, you know, we bought it, you know, September 1st, I believe we closed. And so, you know, we've got two months under our belt and, you know, we look forward to, you know, we got about three stores that are opening between now and the end of the year. And so it'll, it's going to be interesting times ahead and we're excited about it. We Look, we, Pizzas, of, look, burgers and pizza, are, I think the top two categories of people eating outside of the home. So, you know, you know having a presence in those two, you know, verticals is a good thing. And uh, so. Sure. So uh, a few more questions for you. We're about to wrap it up. Uh, okay. You said you played on the same summer league team at summer league team as Cal Ripken and you played third. So he played short. Yeah, he did. He played short. And by the way, he was a hell of a pitcher. Um, oh, was you know, growing up. Yeah. You know, obviously in the big leagues, he played third and short. Um, but growing up, he, you know, he pitched as well as, 
you know, play shortstop. And, you know, he was actually in high school. We were arch rivals. We were in the same county. So he played for Aberdeen. I played for Bel Air. And, you know, we were arch rivals. And we beat him both games, including he pitched against us. But uh, in one of the two. But I played for just two years in a summer league team, travel team. Uh, He ended up you know, going to a different team uh, the last two years of high school that he played for than I did. Um, but, you know, for a couple of years, we played together and, and we knew each other incredibly well. In fact, my sister and his sister have been 10 pin bowling partners for over 30 years. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So our families, you know, when Mr. Ripken died, uh, my mom was invited back to the house to hold nine yards because uh, Ellie's mom, you know, Cal's mom and my mom, you know, go watch the girls bowl on Monday nights. And so, you know, they, uh, the families stayed, you know, very close friends and are still close friends. Could you tell, uh, I mean, if, could you tell, I and mean, basically the whole area could probably tell that this guy was, you know, pretty special. Yeah. You know, Cal was, I tell you, Cal was a, it was a really good athlete. You know, I played a lot of pickup basketball games with him. You know, he could dunk the basketball forward and backwards. So, so the answer is, you know, absolutely. Cause he was, you know, he was bigger, you know, he's six, four, I think he was bigger, more developed than most. And it's funny because his dad was little tough as nails uh, kind of guy, but wasn't a very big guy. Cal was, you know, like I say, six, four. And, and he was, and, and he was a great guy. I mean, he was a great teammate, a great guy. Um, like I say, I hung around a lot with them um, playing basketball in high school. And uh, I went down to my buddy who I played ball with was the clubhouse manager for the Orioles. So even after that, I went down a few times to the clubhouse and, and, and met Cal, hung out with him. And in fact, Coastal, when Cal built Ripken Complex down at Myrtle Beach near Coastal and had some extra AstroTurf left over, and the baseball coach coast asked if I call and see if there was any way he'd donate it. And so I did call and he didn't hesitate. He donated it to the school. And uh, so, you know, he's, he's a, he's a really good, good person as is Billy, his brother. He has another brother, Freddie, that I didn't know very well. Um, but Ellie, his sister, you know, obviously I, we think the world of her. So, you know, sure. so we good family. Very nice. Very nice. Hey, I really appreciate your time today, Mike. Uh, how can people find out more about everything you've got going on? So obviously they can go to emergenthg.com. But HD stands for hospitality group. So emergenthg.com. And, you know, on there, my email address, everything is under my bio. And I'm happy, you know, to answer. E- I answer every email, return every phone call. And, uh, if you're out there and you have a concept in the fast casual sector that you potentially would have an interest in selling, you know, obviously we're constantly looking at new opportunities. And as we said in press releases, we have a number of LOIs out that we're hoping to acquire some other concepts as well. And so, you know, please call and uh, we look forward to it. Okay. Hey, I appreciate your time today, Mike. Thanks so much and uh, best of luck with everything in the future. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. So long, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Top Business Leaders Show, powered by Rise25. Visit rise25.com to check out more episodes of the show and to learn more about how you can start your own podcast.